My name is Rohit Rajan, Social Media Coordinator of the Boston Film Gala. To those of you who don't know, the Boston Film Gala is a two-day film festival aimed at promoting and celebrating local independent filmmakers and all of their hard work and talent throughout the year. Now, the Boston Film Gala will feature various genres such as comedy, drama, animation, music videos, and documentaries, and some of them will be shorts and some of them, some of them will be feature-length films. Now, in addition, a portion of the proceeds will go towards Project Hope, which is a local Boston-based nonprofit whose mission is to help local low-income families escape, uh, escape homelessness and poverty. Now, the Boston Film Gala is not only a film festival, but it's also aimed at celebrating art, which is why we, we accepted art submissions from New England artists and we are displaying them at our venue. Pop Alston. For more information on this, you can visit www.bostonfilmgala.com slash attend or follow us at Boston Film Gala. Now today we are joined by two special guests, Andrea Wolanen, director of Cleaning House, and Christopher Maloney, director of Bonsai Effect. Now these two are filmmakers who you will be seeing at our gala. And first off, I'd like to thank both of you for joining us today. And uh, now, for our audience out there, um, many of them are aspiring filmmakers and many of them out there would like to hear your journey. So, beginning with you, Andrea, could you, could you, tell, a, could you tell our audience out there, what was, your, what was your journey like as a filmmaker? What, aspire, what inspired you to become a filmmaker? What led you to become one? Um, my, so when I was a kid, my parents um, were kind of indie film uh, mm -hmm. fans, so there was a lot of stuff around the house. Um, you know, they were always renting different movies. I was watching Terry Gilliam films as a real young kid. Um, I bullied my mother into letting me watch Pulp Fiction at the age of 10, and it was kind of like, it was all over from there. Um, and I knew I wanted to be involved in it some way, um, but I didn't know how. And then I was watching um, Blazing Saddles by Mel Brooks, which seems like a really random film. Uh, but there's this scene where Madeline Kahn is doing her big musical number in that and they carry her off the stage and as soon as she gets what she thinks is outside of the camera frame she starts laughing and she just has this beautiful like it's a split second where she's caught on camera and, but she thinks she's off and she just has this beautiful glow and about her and in that moment I knew I wanted to work behind the camera um, and I wanted to create something that could make people smile like that and as a horror filmmaker I make people smile in different ways and have different reactions but um, it's just you know I get that same joy working on my films and I, I really am thankful that I identified that aspect uh -huh. you, you, you mentioned you uh, uh, horror film what what drove you to become a horror filmmaker specifically um, when I was about 18 19 um, you know, I, ever since I was a kid, horror terrifies me in a way that's like way more than you would think. Uh -huh. As somebody who makes horror movies should be terrified. Um, but it, when I was about 18, I went to Rock and Shock, which is a horror convention in Worcester, um, with one of my friends from my high school years. And everybody there was so friendly and the community was so tightly knit. Um, and so welcoming that I, I enjoyed being around these people. These, I knew these were the people I wanted to like entertain and I wanted to associate with. And I still go to that convention today. Um, I show my films there now and it's like a complete 360 from when I first went there. And um, you know, the people that I enjoyed meeting that first time are people that I hang out with now. So it's really cool. Oh, okay. um, turnaround effect, I guess. Yeah. Huh. What about, what about you, Chris? I mean, I know the bonsai effect is anything but horror, but uh, what, what led you to become a filmmaker? Uh, well, it, it was a similar thing. I mean, it started when I was very young, and uh, it, was, it was just kind of loving movies so much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, as a kid, movies like E.T. and Jurassic Park, I started noticing that it was the same name at the end of all those, mm -hmm. Steven Spielberg. And, so that's when I was first aware that you could, 
that there were people responsible for those movies and that that was a job somehow. And, um, and I'm from Ohio originally. And when I found out that he was born in Cincinnati, it just made it seem like not necessarily a world away. It made it seem like if someone from Ohio that I looked up to could make my favorite movies, then it was something that I could try to do for myself as well. Okay. And now, now, could you could you guys give us, like us and the audience, just a little without without giving too many too many spoilers or giving too much away, of course. But could you give us a little teaser into what your films would about your films for the for the gala? Yeah. Um, so, Cleaning House is a five minute horror film uh, where two women uh, they go to a house to clean it. Surprise! Surprise! Uh, but it's not exactly what it seems. They, they're sort of tearing around the house, trying on clothes, and drinking the alcohol, and then all of a sudden, everything goes wrong. That's where the horror aspect comes in. Okay. Short and simple, I like it. What about you? <laughs> uh, the bonsai effect is about this um, group of bonsai tree enthusiasts here in New England, and it's about uh, specifically like how caring for these trees has kind of shaped their lives and um, impacted the way they they connect with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Wow, very very contrasting but both very <laughs> very intriguing. You can you can definitely come check these films out if you attend the film gala August 19th to 20th. Um, it's you can follow us at Boston Film Gala to stay updated on this and uh, um, Chris I'm, I'm interested uh, as a, as a documentarian, um, like when you when you go about your when you go about your documentary process, do you do you typically come do you typically come across someone with a document with a compelling story and say I want to document this, or do you do you just say I want to make a documentary and go seeking out someone? How, how does how do you typically make a documentary? Uh, the stories seem to come after me somehow. I mean. There are a hundred stories happening all around us all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, I think a documentary filmmaker doesn't really tell stories so much as they just find stories and help stories tell themselves. Mm -hmm. So usually what happens is something will, I mean lots of things interest me, but if, if something interests me and then also begins to uh, obsess me or just take over my thoughts then I know it's like making a documentary about it is a way of exercising that and it's a way of um, like getting control over my mind again because it it's going to be obsessed with whatever that subject is until I do something about it. Mm -hmm. So so correct me if I'm wrong so essentially what you do is you you when when you get interested in a topic you just dive into that topic and you you just swim around it until that until you finally grab that, that that fish that you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it'll keep me up at night, or it'll just kind of occupy every free thought that I have. Uh -huh. And it's kind of, I, I always think of it as it's it's like asking me to help it tell itself. I know that sounds kind of out there, but um, that that seems to be how it's always happened. Mm -hmm. Can I okay. Ask a question? Yeah, certainly. With the bonsai effect, did you start out by just interviewing people? A lot, or did you did you sort of come up with the story and then tackle it piece by piece? Um, well, I talked to the person who kind of curates the whole nursery where mm -hmm. these trees are, mm -hmm. and um, he kept saying, you know, you should wait until summer because everything's in mm -hmm. bloom then. And I said it, you know, there are lots of beautiful pictures of trees already. Mm -hmm. uh, what's more mm -hmm. interesting is how the trees connect with the people. So let's just talk to everybody and see what they say about it. So for me it was it was all shaped by the interviews. Okay. It was interviews first and then they kind of um, determined what the movie would be by what they said. So so you really stuck to that motto of letting that story tell itself pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And it it once they I mean you'll see in the movie when they talk to me, they're also like trimming their trees or pruning their trees. Yes it's like they feel more comfortable with the tree in front of them. Mm -hmm. Just like a puppeteer feels more comfortable with a puppet rather than themselves. It was like once they were working on the trees, they would tell me anything. Mm -hmm. And so each of them got to share their own story. Definitely. 
and and this is this is for for our filmmakers i mean uh, many many filmmakers out there this is they they as as a filmmaker you every filmmaker experiences this but in pre-production regular production and post-production you will experience creative blocks now how do you guys overcome this i'm, I'm curious and i'm pretty sure our audience is curious i've never had a block never no, no. <laughs> okay, because I was like, all right, we found we found this next to Spielberg. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, you just kind of have to. Uh, you you can't really wait for inspiration. You just start working, and then the inspiration comes. That's mm -hmm. what I find. I mean, uh, there are people who aren't that talented who do well with this because they just keep at it, and it's like like Michael Bay. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I remember hear, hearing Steve Martin say that he he was so naturally without talent that he had to practice twice as hard as everyone else at doing comedy or playing the banjo or anything. And um, I mean, you can you can just kind of fake it till you make it. Just really? keep working through it, and then something strikes. That's what that's what I have found. I, I I have a similar opinion, which is that I. You know, much like you, I when I go out in the world, I see inspiration everywhere. And you know, I a lot of times I'll be having a conversation with somebody, and I'll say a joke, and I'll be like, "That's it." Like, and then I I might not, I might be working on another project then, but then I write that idea down. And when I find myself getting ready to write a script, um, you know, I'll I'll usually already have a lot, list of things that I want to I want to accomplish. And the thing that I found for writing narrative that works the best um, is to just start writing. Mm -hmm. Like, even if you can't think of the perfect first line, just start writing, you know. Yeah. Start in the middle if you have to, and then go back and figure out how you can wrap in the, f the beginning of the story. And I find that if you just force yourself to write and just accept that you're gonna clean it up later, mm -hmm. um, you start getting things that you wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, you know, there's a there's a poet whose name I'm gonna forget uh, off the top of my head but she always said her experience with writing would be she'd be out working in the garden or on a farm she she lived in the countryside and she would feel as if the poem was thundering towards her over the fields mm -hmm. and she would have to run inside and get paper and pencil before it hit her and wow. if she could get it as it hit her she could write it down and have the poem on paper in front of her and I think there is an element there that's accurate where sometimes you have to start before it hits you or you know you you start writing and you're not really happy with what you're getting but then you start getting into the groove of it and then you start putting things down that you wouldn't have thought of if you were waiting for the inspiration do, do you believe in, in Chris's whole fake it till you make it approach where like even even if you it's similar. don't have the like yeah do, do you feel that that like extra hard work can compensate for that? Absolutely, lack of exactly, absolutely. And I think that it's it's less, um, you know, the fake it till you make it thing is the like pretend like fake that you have inspiration until it starts coming to you. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, fake it till you make it is essentially like saying practice. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, you can't you can't be a perfect cinematographer on the first try and you can't be a perfect writer on the first try and if you are i would like to meet you yeah and i need more cinematographers in my life as always so <laughs> <laughs> um i think that uh the the thing is is you just need to practice mm -hmm. and and work on it you know and, and i think it is one of those things where you need to learn um and you can't be right on your first try yeah it is work i mean it's you get inspired sometimes, but mm -hmm. you still have to sit down and yeah. even you know, still, when the inspiration's not there. Yeah, yeah, and even if you are inspired, like I've been in cleaning house, actually came from me telling a joke to one of my friends, and I'm like, oh my god, that's a great idea. Um, I can make that creepy, <laughs> and um, you know, then after telling that joke, I still had to sit down and put it on paper, and there were parts of it I didn't know what to do with at first, and then. I kept rewriting and rewriting until I, I hit the notes that I knew it needed to get. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure 
I mean, everyone everyone has a unique story for this, but uh, what? So starting starting with you, Chris. Um, but uh, what what was your first filming experience like? I mean, regardless of whether or not the film actually got released, but uh, what was what was that story like? Uh, Do you remember? Yeah, the the first thing I ever worked on out of film school was a documentary about Andy Kaufman, mm -hmm. and uh, it was. I mean, the the thing about documentaries is uh, you can work very singularly. That was one of the reasons why um, that was what I started with, because you can have 64 silver dollars and be able to put together, I mean, especially if you're not paying yourself. You don't, a lot of times, need a crew with a documentary. You can just take one camera, which is what I do. And, um, yeah, it's, it, it, was, uh, it was like I didn't even know enough to know what I didn't know. It just, um, I mean, like, when you think about it now, you can't make a movie without money. But I didn't really know that. I just, even without money, I just borrowed a camera and started going. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, did, I, did, you, did, you, did you ever, so did you release it or try to go anywhere with it? Or was it just mainly for your own practice? Well, I was living in New York at the time, and there was an independent theater that played it there. Uh-huh. Side. And then after that, a very small uh, DVD distribution company picked it up. So it had it had a little life of its own, but um, which for a first film, I was happy about. Yeah, the, the, that's pretty. That's a pretty good start. Yeah, it was a start. Definitely. Hey, what about what about you, Andre? Mine did not have a release or showing in the Lower East Side, unfortunately. I made it when I was nine, ten, ten. Um, with my best friend, and ironically it was horror, and it was called The Crazy Lady Upstairs, and we shot it in a bookcase with Barbies, and some very- Barbies are always scary, yeah. Yeah, Barbies <laughs> are terrifying, and then some very practical uh, pyrotechnic effects, uh -huh. um, shooting through a candle to emulate fire, and like, it was very, uh, I wish I still had a copy of it somewhere because I feel like that would be the perfect bonus feature on a DVD. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was my first experience. And then after that, it was quickly followed by Pool Party Massacre, which also starred my Barbies. Um, and yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a busy time in my, my preteens uh, for making movies. But then after film school, my first uh, film, I, I went to work at WGBH. Um, as a producer, and then my first film, uh, my own film that I made after that was uh, M is for Mundane, um, which you can actually find online if you just search M is for Mundane, ABCs of Death too. Um, it was a submission for their open call, mm -hmm. and uh, it got pretty high. It was in the top 20 um, of like 200 that were were made, um, but it didn't ultimately get in the final one. Uh, but that was my first one. After. Okay. Yeah. Shown at a few festivals, uh -huh. and it's very popular on the YouTube's. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Well, now, lastly, before we before we move on to um, the audience Q and A's, um, do do you have any advice for uh, any up and coming filmmakers who could be watching right now? Any mistakes that you guys maybe have made in the past that? You would stress that uh, anyone avoid or any any sort of advice that you would give to the novice filmmakers watching. Uh, Chris, we can start with you. Yeah, I I tried something a few years ago that uh, it was kind of what I thought uh, people would like, and I looking back I didn't have much of a personal connection to it, and. Um, after it was done, I thought I, I can't do that again because it, the film, making a film takes so much work and so many resources that unless you're unless it's personal to you and you have a connection that'll see you through to the end, it's it's really kind of a waste of time. But, I mean that's what I found. So it has to be something that, uh, like it has to be something that only I feel like I can tell in a way that someone else. So that's what I would say. Just uh, kind of, sort of like stick to what you know, but um, something that moves you, you have to trust that it'll move someone else. Okay. Um, one of my, I mean, it's not, 
I wouldn't necessarily say it's based on a mistake that I've made, uh -huh. but on personal experience, on working on other people's projects, on seeing films and on making my own. Um, one of my biggest lessons has always been to trust your crew and trust your cast. And if you feel that they're, they're not understanding something in your script, um, to try and figure out why they're not understanding it and what they think it should be. Um, because you're not, you know, you are making a movie for yourself and it does have to be something that you're passionate about, but you have to understand that the audience isn't gonna see it all your way. And I think in line with that is um, hiring an editor. Because <laughs> um, I can edit movies fine, but when I edit my own films, I get lost. You know, you lose the story because you've been working on it so long. And I've had editors bring things out of my films that I wasn't even aware existed within my films um, and has made them better because of that. And I think never underestimating outside influence um, on your films because you should never forget that you're making them for an audience. You know, you are making them because you have to tell a story in some ways, but at the same time, the ultimate goal is to give them to an audience. And so, so total creative control is a bit overrated. Yeah, I mean, I mean overrated. overrated. Yeah. I think, you know, um, you don't have to take every opinion, uh -huh. but um, you know, you have to think about it. You are obliged to think about it, you know? Of course. So that's about, about it that I've gotten, I think, is really just being able to let go and being able to collaborate in the creative process mm -hmm. can be very important. Definitely. Now, now uh, that, that concludes all of uh, my questions for uh, the afternoon. Now we'd like to open up the questions to you. The viewers so now if you if you guys have any questions or, or comments from uh, Facebook live now uh, it's open so uh, we're, we're taking for the next uh, five minutes or so we're taking any questions or comments from you guys so let us know so we have Pat back he says I really enjoy Chris's work puts heart and soul into it that's somebody you know excellent question <laughs> Question mark. Do you feel you put heart and soul into your work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And then I also have um, my own question. That's okay. I haven't typed it in yet. But <laughs> no, no, it has to go through Facebook. Yeah. Sorry. We'll wait. Yeah. Tatiana asks, <laughs> um, out of the two films that are premiering at Boston Film or or screening at Boston Film Gala, what was the most fun thing about working on that film for you? Okay. Um, I basically turned, because I wanted to get the claustrophobic effect that I hope Cleaning House achieves, um, I insisted my entire cast and crew stay at the Airbnb that we were filming in. So <laughs> I made them dinner, I made them breakfast, I made them lunch, but they stayed there <laughs> and they had to film there. And I think that it, it really um, turned into a very fun project and I think it affected the mood of the two main characters in it who are supposed to be impossibly close. And then that would be quickly followed up if you don't mind me following it up with um, the audition that I first did for Cleaning House was with the two main leads and I have never seen two people connect so immediately and so thoroughly from doing romantic horror films from doing you know work outside of here that was narrative that involved people needing to have a chemistry the two of them had a chemistry from go like it was amazing and I left and I turned to it Adrian, my producer, and the first thing I said to her is, what am I supposed to do? We have three more auditions. <laughs> I know that that's who I want, but we're supposed to do three more auditions. So uh, that was that was just, it was a lightning bolt. For me, the best part was uh, kind of just being around the trees themselves. Like, when you go into this, um, this garden that's in the movie, there's such a like a wet earthy smell as soon as you go in and it just it's kind of a feeling of literally being grounded so um that that was that was really cool and that was and i have a bonsai tree now and um and it's definitely just like the people in the movie it's helped to 
just shape my life. And it, it does uh, touch on how I kind of see other things and connect with other things. Mm -hmm. Do you also like prune and shape the, yeah. the bonsai tree? Yeah, I do. Do they teach you how to do it or do you kind of just go uh, it? Well, I kept asking what I was supposed to do and um, they kept saying, you just have to trust yourself. So it's, and that's what, that's, I think that's what is unique about it is that um, I think people are looking for directions on how many times to water it a week and things like that. And the answers you get are trust your instinct, uh, let it become part of your day, interact with it, see what it needs. Um, so that's, uh, it, it just makes it a very unique thing to be part of. Jackie Waters says, Hi Boston Film Gala. I was wondering, what can a person do to support a local director? As local directors, <laughs> how would you answer that? Well, we always need money, I mean, to, to make these things. So, uh, supporting things like, you know, through Kickstarter and so forth, that's, that's really helpful. I mean, money is money is kind of the key with film. But um, uh, I think you know the other thing you can do is just go to screenings. You know, I, I I feel like every time I have a good audience at one of my screenings, it makes me remember why I got into this, and it makes it so much more worthwhile to hear people laugh or shriek or talk to me about it afterwards. Um, so I think following things like Boston Film Gala or some of the other great local festivals, um, following uh, us on Facebook, finding us on Facebook and following us um, to see when we are screening, because I'll always give shout outs, um, going to local, local film events, those are all huge ways to do it. And I think growing the local community is always uh, very big as well. Com community is really key for something like this. I mean, there are lots of ways to get involved now, like you're saying, and there are lots of great theaters in Boston that offer unique things that you can get involved in, classes and things like that. So, just just getting your feet wet somehow, with something like that. And talk to us. That that always helps. Hearing feedback is always great. And I have another follow-up question. Um, so I saw both films and I really enjoyed them and they are very different. But at the end of it, um, you know, going into it, I was looking at the title and I didn't really know what to expect. And I, I like to watch movies without reading the synopsis first, personally, sometimes. Um, but once I saw the films, I was like, that title is spot on. <laughs> I loved it. Talk to us a little bit about what is your process for naming a film that you do? Does it, you know, kind of, come as you're working on it? Is it something that you sort of go at it when you first start to script it as best as you can when you're working with documentary? Mm -hmm. um, what did that process look like for you? I, the whole time working on it, the working title was The Bonsai People. And then uh, I found out to my chagrin that there was a feature documentary released a few years ago called The Bonsai People, which is not about bonsai trees. It's oh. about like, uh, <laughs> Micro loans for small businesses. It was like it was green in that. Yeah, so like that. They, took, they took such a great title and didn't even do a movie about bonsai trees, and I was annoyed. Um, my wife came up with the bonsai effect, which I, I I was afraid at first it was a little too on the nose, but then I liked it because it almost sounds like a John Grisham thriller or something, or like some kind of political thriller, the bonsai effect. I was kind of hoping it was going to be like some weird sci-fi when I heard the title. Yeah. It was like crazy sci-fi bonsai be, tree movie. Right. <laughs> it could be something other than what it is, which I like. Um, I've done it both ways, or I've done it a multitude of ways. My first film, uh, M is for Mundane, I, it had to be called M is for something. And that word I felt was really where the, um, the film sort of hooked on. And when I came up with M is for Mundane, I thought it was going to be, it was really distinct, I thought, because most of the other ones were M is for Murder, M is for Man, and no offense, those are, those are very descriptive, but I thought Mundane is like, how can you make a horror movie mundane? And so that was always the title, and I wrote the story for that title. Um, my other two 
stories, one changed cleaning house shot and I they were originally house sitters but I thought it didn't quite work um, them calling it house sitting and then the whole cleaning house with the little metaphor therein sort of helps um, it just it just worked better that way so we changed it the day before and changed the script a little bit and that was about it Amy Bridget Maloney says to both filmmakers What's your favorite movie? I mean, mine's always changing. I, I, I mean, I have I have pretty much a list where the standards stay the same, but the number one spot rotates. Well, what are your top three? Uh, what's the number one spot right now? <laughs> I think probably, um, I would say To Kill a Mockingbird. Probably number one right now. Um, I usually, it changes a lot for me too. I think that's something it's hard for filmmakers to pick one. I have the top 10, which sort of rotate uh, even in themselves, but I would say uh, I really like the directors Terry Gilliam, Wong Kar Wai, and David Lynch. Um, it's usually one of those. Um, and uh, I should put a female director in there somewhere. Jesus. There's not that many of us. Unfortunately, Jane Campion. I love her. Um, so it's usually between Chunking Express, The Piano, Brazil, and, uh, you know, I'm going to say Terry Gilliam. Okay. David Lynch, yeah, or Razorhead, or Wild at Heart. And actually, uh, I have one last question before we end the Facebook Live chat. And uh, my question is, is for the filmmakers that are watching right now, what would be some resources that you would recommend to them to help get them going and, and head into the direction where you're going? Nofilmschool.com. Nofilmschool.com. I think it's .com. Um, it's, it's super helpful. Like from the smallest little trick to do with your tripod to, you know, how to, produce a movie essentially it's really it's really has a lot of great articles on it um, reading up on it and joining um, working on other people's productions which sounds like me being like hey guess what it should work for me um, but it's working on other productions you learn a lot like I've learned from people who've been directing less time than me by watching them and vice versa um, you know it's you learn a lot from working with other people there's a book about uh, Bernard Hartzog called A Guide for the Perplexed. It's a very thick, dense book, pretty much of just him talking about making documentaries and kind of his philosophies on life. And, and um, that's been instrumental for me, especially if you're going to make documentaries. That's uh, something you should check out. Anthony Landry. <laughs> Sorry. Apparently somebody we know. Yes. <laughs> says, what is the next project that you will be working on? Thank you for reminding me to promote myself. Um, I just finished uh, my master's degree um, and I'm completing an interactive film called Glass Houses. Um, and recently JK, who runs a great horror um, podcast, interviewed me on it um, and commented that all of my films tend to happen within houses. Um, and this is no different. Uh, it's sort of about a horror that comes from family and religion. And um, I'm hoping to film it this fall and winter and finish it by 2017. Uh, I did a short narrative two summers ago that I'm hopefully this summer uh, doing a, a feature version of that. So that's what I'll be. It's not a documentary. so. Do you have a title for it yet? Dogwood. The Dogwood or Dogwood? Dogwood. Dogwood. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, guys. Uh, I guess that does it for uh, audience Q and A's. Um, thank you, guys, so much for uh, taking the time to come and interview with us yeah, today. Thank you. Um, remember to the audience, we'll be doing filmmaker interviews every Thursday uh, up until the Boston Film Gala, which is on the 19th and 20th and uh, remember you can 
uh, if you if you want to learn more about the Boston Film Gala, remember to visit bostonfilmgala.com slash attend, or you can follow us on social media at Boston Film Gala. Now, uh, again, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Andrea, yeah. and thank you, Chris. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you next Thursday. <laughs>